Hey everyone, what's happening? This is Norm Schriever of Real Estate Marketing with Norm, and uh, this is my very first podcast, a special episode, not only because it's the first, but because we have the great agent Kevin Cooper of Cooper & Associates Realty uh, is my guest today. I'm going to interview him about sales. And for those of you who know Kevin, he's one of the best salespeople um, and one of the best realtors as well that you'll ever find. Uh, Kevin was also happened to be the person who got me into the business a million years ago when I uh, was a realtor and then owned a small mortgage company in California. So it's pretty fitting that he's the first guest. And we had a a lot of hard work, a lot of good times, actually closed a few deals, um, but I learned a whole lot from him, so I wanted to share some of uh, his insights and wisdom here about sales. So without further ado, here's Kevin Cooper. Thanks for listening. This whole thing rolling here. Tell me a little, if you Perfect. want, backtrack um, your initial story in, in real estate, how you first got into real estate. Sure. Um well, let me see. I was working at UPS and I was a manager there and we we're doing quite well. Um, at the time though, I just divorced and my daughter was four years old. Um, she's now 25 and getting married next month, by the way. That's insane. Um, yeah. My yeah. Is that yeah. crazy? And so we, uh, you know, I was, I was get, getting up the corporate ladder there offering the promotions and finally they offered me a very nice promotion to run North and South Carolina. Um, and I appreciated the gesture, but, you know, as a single father with joint custody of my daughter, that just wasn't a possible alternative. So I said, give me something closer to the coast, you know, and I can use Southwest Airlines or something. And then they went ahead and offered me a couple of weeks later, Iowa. I said, how about Iowa? I said, no, I can't do that. And at that point, you know, I told them no twice, and they probably felt that I was blocking a spot. So I became, I said, the favorite child, the stepchild real fast. And so I looked at it and felt probably uh, underappreciated at that point and thought, well, let me go ahead and go into real estate. And I had some friends who had gone in and it seems like everybody was doing well. And this is back in, you know, right about 2003. Mm. Um, so I came on into real estate and, you know, the, the beauty of it is I came in, I wasn't on my ass, you know, I had a couple bucks in the bank and everything. Um, but I came in with a resolve that I was going to work just as hard for myself as I did for um, UPS. Yeah. And UPS, you know, I was high salary, their quotes, um, but I was working 70 hours a week to do it, six days a week. Um, so I chose to go ahead and do the same thing when I came in and I joined a company called Prudential at the time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so, yep. And so what we would do is I would come in, my start time at UPS was 4.30 in the morning. So I'd started at Prudential at 4.30 in the morning. And I'd come into the office and, you know, the lights weren't even on. I had to find the override switch to turn the lights on. Um, and then I would go ahead and start working. People were like, what in the hell were you doing at 4.30 in the morning? I said, well, I would go ahead and email. I'll tell you what, you email somebody at 4.30 in the morning, you know, it gets your attention. And then there were no agents who would come in the office till at least 9 o'clock. So I had all that time to myself just to go ahead and you know, do the research for my clients and really over service them. And then by the time the agents came in the office, I was ready to get out into the field and be face to face with my clients and go and show them houses and do everything I could. And the one thing that I found was somewhat of, of an epiphany is my entire time being employed prior to that. I was always paid once a month. Yeah. And, um, and, and it worked over time. It was really negative dollars an hour because I was a salaried employee. So, this thing is like, you mean if I work more, I can get paid more? It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I work on Saturday, I can get paid more? Yeah, yeah. And that was probably the worst thing ever. You know, I just went ahead and just ran crazy and just worked myself to exhaustion and, and, and made a lot of money. And I always wondered how could, you know, UPS pay me the, this this much money? And it got to the point where some months I'd make as much in a month as I did in an entire year at UPS. Yeah. And that was a six-figure salary. Yeah. And I know – um Coming into it, I mean, the work ethic, and I, I saw it on display, was was amazing. But also, you were saying, hey, uh, I'm going to basically model or find out the, the top agents, what are they doing, and model my behaviors after them. And I know you read every single book available about, about yeah. real estate and about sales, right? Yeah, that was uh, one thing I felt having more for so long at UPS and coming into real estate, I felt I was behind by 17 years because that's how long I was there. So I made a commitment to myself that I'd read one book a week every single week for the first year that I was in the business. And I ended up doing that for two years. And they were all real estate, finance, or mortgage. 
and so it helped me get a lot of a no- lot of knowledge in a short amount of time. Mm, fantastic. So, and you said you were behind by seventeen years in terms of you know a, a business outside of UPS or how things ran in real estate, but it seems like you already knew sales pretty well and had a good. Uh, obviously management training at UPS, but what, um, what did you see when you first came in with sales with real estate and, and basically just what, what is sales to you? You know, that's a great question. Um, for me, I had never had a sales job. Honestly, I had, um, I worked at a hardware store. Um, it was called handyman when I was like 17 years old. And if someone came in and asked for something and they said, Hey, do you think this will work? You'd always say, yes, that'll work unless it was gas or electrical. Then you never told them that. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then aside from that, um, you know, I, even at UPS, I never even was in business development. I was never in actual sales. I ran mm-hmm. the phone center. Mm-hmm. And so when people had to escalate their calls, um, then they wanted to talk to the president of the company. They ended up talking to me. And that's one thing that I did learn is it's called service recovery. And that's just when you, when you let somebody down, you know, they'd say, Hey, this guy is the meanest, nastiest person I've ever heard. He's cursed everybody out up to, including my supervisors. And then they finally get him to me. And the first thing I would just say is, Hey, Norm, I'm so sorry that we let you down. How can I make it right? Mm. And it would just diffuse the situation. Sometimes people would rant and rave and go on and on. But after a while, if you're, up here, you know, angry and I'm stay calm. At some point, one of us has to go in the other direction. I would stay calm and they bring down and um, they were just nice and calm and, and, and they'd resolve it and they'd be grateful and happy. And after we got everything resolved, I said, I just want to let you know, I so appreciate your business, Norm. Um, I'm going to go ahead and refund your package and um, we're going to reorder it so you don't even have to go through the trouble of doing it. So we'll have that shipped right out and we're going to upgrade it and get it sent overnight. And by the way, I, I happen to notice that you like the Sacramento Kings and I have a couple extra tickets to the Kings game tonight. Would you like to go? And so you could do things like that, and you know, depending on the value of the client, and you could go ahead and penetrate the market. So that was the closest to sales that I'd been prior to coming into real estate. Okay. And I think the, the the thing with real estate, when I looked at the sales, it was just meeting people's needs. At, at that time, um, lending guidelines were very um, lax, and so virtually everybody, it seemed like, was qualified for a loan. And so it was everyone's American God-given right to own a home. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I, of course I'm saying that sarcastically, but anybody that wanted a home, I just put him um, in front of a lender, and if they could qualify, we went out and found him a home. And uh, it was uh, really gratifying because you're you're generally changing lives. You're getting people, you know, what they wanted. There, some of them were not in great neighborhoods or great situations, and they're able to have a piece of the American dream. So that was actually really cool, and you know, very gratifying, and, and it paid well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I know, you know, when you talk about, let's say, a new realtor coming in the business, right, and all the education pieces that are put in front mm-hmm. of them with their broker or with book, you're going to hear about finance and investment and how to flip and how to fix and how to, you know, have a geographic farm and all these and prospect. But man, you don't hear enough about sales. And it's almost like sales is almost like a a bad word or something like that. So first off, why is sales training so damn important for realtors? And then why is it so sort of neglected or or even frowned upon? You know, it's it's funny. You're right. There is a negative connotation by many people with the word sales. And many agents will say, I'm not a salesman. That's too salesy. I will go ahead and I will, um, I service my clients. And uh, I just kind of laugh. No, you need to sell. If nothing happens, if nobody sells anything, nothing's going to get done. And here's to my point. You could be the smartest, best real estate agent in the world. You could know more than anybody. You could have higher skill set than everybody. But if you don't have a client, you will go out of business, Hmm. right? And so I've seen people who didn't have the skill but they just had the tenacity, and um, they didn't even have the intellect. But they went out there, and nothing was going to stop them from getting their dream. And they go out there, and they'll crush you to this day. There's people far less educated, far less intelligent, air quotes on that one, um, but they would just kick my behind or anybody else's because nothing's standing in their way. And I think sales is a great equalizer. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, what, what uh, you know, what's – when you when you look at sales, particularly with real estate, what's important mm-hmm. for the average realtor? Like, how is sales different for them, or what does sales look like uh, from start to finish with the with the realtor? 
With a realtor, the sale really starts um, from the first time you meet that client. So whether it's someone from your sphere of influence, whether it's someone from an open house, but if they're doing their job right, you, you kind of take a consultative role mm. and you need to, number one, first be prepared, right? They say success is where preparation meets, op- meets opportunity. So if you're prepared and you've done like all your scripts and your dialogues and you're ready for your objection handlers and you're the local area expert and you've done what you're supposed to do, when you meet the person, it's really easy because all you have to do is listen to them and you just ask questions. And what I found what works really well is if I'm trying to garner information, I'm going to ask open-ended questions. Like, you know, hey, so you're looking for a home, Norm. Wow, okay, well, what exactly are you looking for? Okay, well, tell me more about that. Well, why is that important to you? Well, why are you deciding to move anyhow? And so you ask all these questions, and every time you say something, if I'm doing my job right, I'm writing it down and taking notes. And then it's no different than the police. You know, they have a saying, anything you say can and will be used against you. <laughs> and I'll go ahead and say, <laughs> Norm, um, if I'm hearing you right, you said the reason you want to move is your son is getting bullied at school and you don't feel it's safe for him anymore. And you want to go ahead and get him out of the neighborhood you're in and get him into the best school district over here in your Pleasant Grove. Is that correct? And he's going to say yes. And that does a couple of things. Number one, it's kind of a sound check mm. where that person is understanding they've been heard. And if there's something you did, here wrong, they can go ahead and correct you. But in the meantime, the other thing while you're selling this person is you use the person's name over and over again because your name is like the most sincerest form of flattery. And I will call you Norm a thousand times. And then also, you have to learn how to go ahead and use things that are like sales techniques, like tie downs. And a tie down isn't a manipulation, it's just gaining agreement. So if I yeah. say something, I just say, you know, right, that makes sense. And so we're doing these little things, and they're, they're, the aggregate total of all these little yeses is when it's time to make that big yes. Like the soft a whole lot closes. Not to interrupt, but I mean, you always talk yeah. about the soft closes, right? And you, you basically get that agreement, and it's a solid footing for you to move to the next step, right? Absolutely. And, and in fact, you know, I just I sold a home last week, and I had one of my new agents, and I showed them. I pretty much made the person who was buying the home sell me on why they should buy the house. So I, I I went, I showed them everything in the house. I pointed out things that I felt they should be aware of. One house was next to a railroad track. You know, it wasn't a big deal to my client, but I said, I assure you when you sell it, it's going to be a big deal to 90% of the people. You know, so, and they realize that you are looking out for their best interest. And so you generally, besides having a fiduciary responsibility to them, I believe you have a, a moral responsibility to do the right thing and really try to help that person get what they want. Mm. So, Kevin, I understand you're saying questions are very important. <laughs> is that correct? No. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> so you mentioned you mentioned something about prospecting, objection handling, your scripts. Mm-hmm. Uh, stop for a second there, because that's something I think also realtors, mortgage lenders, any any sales professional doesn't spend enough time on. But it's super valuable once you get it down. So uh, spend a second on on those if you don't mind. Absolutely. And so, you know, in order for us to sell these homes, we need to have clients. In order to go get clients, we have to find them. So there's different ways you can get a client. If you're running your business successfully in real estate, usually 65 to 70% of your business should come from people that are in your sphere of influence. And so people say, who's my sphere of influence? Well, if you pick up your cell phone, Virtually everybody in your cell phone is part of your sphere of influence. So your friends, your family, your coworkers, your colleagues, the people you go to church with, pretty much anybody that knows you is in your sphere of influence. Mm. And then it's your job is to take those people and put them in your database and then kind of qualify them. You have to find out who's going to do business with you and who's not. So if I call Norm up, I say, hey, Norm, just want to let you know, I'm just uh, I, I sent you a letter. Did you get it? Okay, great. You got it? Yeah. I've joined this great company called Cooper & Associates Real Estate, and I'm going to go ahead and sell homes. And the reason I'm calling you is if you knew somebody that wanted to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, would you refer them to me? And Norm would say, of course I'd refer them to you. And say, well, great, Norm. That's awesome. Hey, with your permission, I'm going to go ahead and add you to my database. Let me confirm your name, your address, your email, your phone number. And also, Norm, I'm going to go ahead and place you on my client appreciation list. And what that means is periodically I'm going to invite you to some events. Uh, I'll give you an annual uh, analysis of your home in terms of its value. And just send out items of value to you just to let you know I really appreciate you and remind you that I'm in the real estate business. Is that okay, Norm? 
fantastic. And I'd go ahead and I'd hang up the phone and, you know, I'd send you a handwritten card right afterwards. And maybe in the handwritten card, I'd put three business cards in there. And then I'd follow that back up a few days later and say, hey, Norm, did you get the card I sent you? And he'd say, yeah, I did. And you put three cards in there, Kevin, why'd you do that? And I said, well, you know, one to use, one to lose, and, and one, one to, to give, give away. away. Go out yeah. there and give my card away. <laughs> right? And then, and, and so then as soon as you hang up the phone, you laugh and we have a good time. And then maybe I circle back and, you know, I find out that you're a Raiders fan. And so maybe I send you a, a box of Kleenex, you know, with the Raiders on it and saying, hey, here you go, Norm. Enjoy your season. You <laughs> oh, know? Or cold. maybe I that's send cold. you an, an item that might be a, um, you know, the valuation of your house, what, what, a market, what a market analysis looks yeah. like. But things like that. And then after I send that, I wait a couple of days and call you back again. So basically what I did is I just did, it's called a quick six mm-hmm. and that's touching someone six times in a relatively short period of time. And it shows number one, that you follow up. It shows that you are professional, but also you never lose sight of who you are. If, if we laugh and joke all the time, don't get real serious on the phone with somebody because you're making a sales call, right? Yep. You have to be true to who you are, but you've, after those six touches, you firmly established that you're someone that can be accounted on. And then that's how you'll get a referral. If you just tell somebody one time that I sell real estate and then you see them six months later and they bought a house from somebody else, you have nobody to blame but yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, a method to the madness on, like you said, the quick six or it's there's a system to it, though it's also personalized and you could keep your personality. Absolutely. And you have to find out what works, works well for you. You know, um, lead generation comes in many different forms. Yeah. Some people will buy leads, you know, buy them from the Internet, you know, from different companies. Some people will go no go knocking on doors. You know, some people want to have open houses. And any of those, as well as a list of others, can be successful and you can make a lucrative living. Um, But you have to do something that feels good to you. If you hate knocking on doors, guess what? You're probably not going to be successful doing it. Yeah. And also, you know, it's great to have a system and you you have to have all the preparation in the world. But you you remember that a lot of the clients come from just getting out there and – you know, being in public and talking to people and smiling and, and you know, in line at Home Depot at a party. Um, I, I remember a lot of times, you know, they say a sale is a transfer of enthusiasm, right? And I remember being yeah. around the office and just the energy was good and we're celebrating victories and we're having fun and challenging each other. But I remember a lot of times we would sell by example. For instance, uh, you know, the daily searches for homes for an investor and you saw a screaming deal, you would go around and you would talk to everyone you knew about it and not necessarily trying to get them to buy it, but just showing them an example of what's possible. Hey, I saw this house today. Um, you know, it's three bedroom, one bath. It's in a decent neighborhood for 198. That's probably 30 grand under market value. And, and, telling everyone about that. And then, you know, I got my client in there and now he already has made all this equity and he fixed it up and he's going to reset. And uh, you get people excited with those examples. And and with real estate, I think it's so, so good because you could sell it with, uh, with, it doesn't have to be your own listing. You could sell examples of any other house on the market, any other listing to get buyers excited too. Absolutely. And, And that's just, you know, when you do it, everybody seems to, want to be a real estate investor, right? Mm. That's just sexy. Whether you really are or whether you really aren't, whether you're good or whether you suck. But if you just say, I'm a real estate investor, it's just so sexy. Talk dirty to me, right? (laughs) And so all all we need to do is just let people know is if they already own a home, hey, have you ever thought about investing in a property? And so we know if you have your money sitting in your checking and you're checking your savings account, you're getting virtually nothing on it, right? In fact, you're losing more to inflation than you are with your money growing. So we work so very hard to get our money. How can we get our money working for us? And that's through investing. So investing in real estate is a very sound investment, in my opinion. You know, it is in the market. There are ebbs and flows, yes. Um, But unlike the stock market, probably not going to go down to zero. I mean, you may have heard of this stock. It was called this company called Enron, right? Yeah. Well, guess what? How much is Enron stock worth now? Uh, That would be nothing, right? And so the point to my story is in real estate, even with the ebbs and flows, when we had our, you know, deep, deep, deep recession of 2008, um, in some areas, homes lost 50% of their value. And in most areas, almost all of that value is back now. Yeah. Yeah. And so what, I mean, what you just said from a sales perspective, 
it's it's not an accident. It's not something you just came up with. You have uh, you do your market research. You have your objection handling. You have your little elevator pitches. These are all snippets that the average agent, if they're really on top of things and doing their research, they could personalize these statistics and these objection handling uh, tactics and use them all day long, right? Absolutely. And, and you know, it's so funny. I think people make it to be much harder than what it is. Yeah. When it comes to objection handling, for example, on the, on the buy side and on the sell side, there's probably only about five or six. Mm. People will make it spider out to about 20 or 30 or something, but it's about five or six basic objections. And almost any objection you ever get, here's, here's the golden nugget. If you don't get anything else today, if someone gives you an objection, the best thing you can say is, and why is that important to you, Norm? Mm. So I, I want to wait until summer. And why is that important to you, Norm? You know, and when you go ahead and you ask those questions, sometimes people will talk themselves out of something or talk themselves into something. But all you're doing is just merely asking a question. And you're genuinely looking to understand because just because someone says, um, I want to wait, doesn't mean you have to believe what they're saying. It doesn't mean there's a good reason. But help me understand because maybe they don't have to wait. And, you know, if, if someone said, for example, they're going to wait. I mean, the Fed up until recently has been really clear that they want to raise the rates, right? Mm. And, and, and they've done that other than most here recently. And the other thing is, historically, our prices keep on going up for the most part. I know um, God's not making any more land. The population keeps on going up. Simple laws of supply and demand tell you over time, real estate prices are continuing to go up. So if I know these things to be true, Norm, and you believe that waiting six months or nine months is in your best interest, interest, I might give you a different perspective. If the interest rate goes up by an eighth or a quarter or maybe more, if the homes go up by 4000 5000 10000 you'd be the first client that I ever had that wanted to pay more for less. Now, you're not really that guy, are you, Norm? Mm, there you go. And that's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's basically another close. Um, and speaking right. of that with closes, I mean, what, uh, def define a close and, and what are some of your favorite closes or, or what do you see with real estate with closing? You know, the close is just asking for the order, you okay. know, and it comes at the appropriate time. I think some people will oversell and I think that's, you know, too much. You, you, you throw up on yourself. I remember I had a professor and I'll share this with you and it's a, uh, it's a very long phrase, but he said, your knowledge of a subject matter is is inversely proportioned to your ability to express it with brevity. I'll mm -hmm. say that again. Your knowledge of a subject matter is inversely proportioned to your ability to express it with brevity. Mm. And what that says quite simply is, if you've ever gone to somebody and they're trying to sell you something, but they don't really know what the hell they're talking about, and 15 minutes later they're still trying to convince you that they know what they're talking about, right? Yeah. Or you go to somebody who's mastered it and they say, Norm, it's like peanut butter and jelly. And it makes perfect sense. It's like, oh my God. You know, so like these computer guys, they can speak computer geek talk, but also translate to a dumb guy like me, and it makes sense. Those people truly have a gift. And if we're that sort of person, if we can take all this legal jumbo, uh, mumbo jumbo in terms of someone buying a house and just make it really simple, then they'll understand. And, and I'll give you an example of that. So when someone's buying a house, for example, a buyer, you know, I think it would be very reasonable to think they have a lot of anxiety, a lot of apprehension. And so, you know, what they need to do is write that offer to secure that house for them, right? So I would just say something like this. I'd say, Norm, you know, you're not actually buying the house today. You're just reserving your right to buy in the future. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you more about that? And you'll say, yeah. Well, see, once we write this contract and accept it, you're going to have three days to get your earnest money deposit in. If for some reason you don't get it in, guess what? We have no deal, right? Then pass that. Once we're actually in contract, you're going to have these three things which are called contingencies. And a contingency is your get out of jail free card. Your first contingency is your inspection contingency. And you're going to be able to get inspectors into the home to verify that this is, in fact, a good house and in the condition that you expect it is, that it's in. Once you get that contingency, then you go ahead and release it. It's kind of like playing poker, right? You play yeah. poker, first you kind of ante up. So we ante up, we just release the first contingency. Then your next contingency norm is going to be the appraisal. And the appraisal contingency is that person's going to come out there and verify that you're not overpaying for this property, and they're also going to verify the square footage of the property that it matches what the owner claims, right? Mm -hmm. And once you're comfortable with that, then you go ahead and release that contingency, and you're kind of anteing up again, right? And then finally, the third contingency is your loan contingency. And, you know, unless you're going to buy this thing cash, which most people don't, 
is all predicated, this entire deal is predicated on you getting the loan. And only once your loan officer says that it's, your loan's approved, you can go ahead and release that contingency, do you release that? And you release that third and final contingency, it's like playing poker and pushing all your chips in. Yeah. And the only thing that's really at risk is going to be your earnest money deposit. So another way that I tell the story sometimes is, you know, I grew up playing Pop Warner football. And we played with some kids who were literally on the other side of the tracks. I remember one time we'd won a game. My parents bought a pizza for us all to share. As soon as the pizza hit the table, a couple of kids licked their fingers and then touched all those pieces of pizza that they wanted, right? (laughs) Grossed me the hell out. But I tell my clients, so tonight, all you're doing, you're just being that kid. You're marking your territory. You're licking that piece of pizza saying it's mine, right? But you're not actually buying the house tonight. Does that and, make sense? And man, those those stories, the analogies, that's such good uh, such good ammunition for sales, right? I mean, because people relate, they laugh, it's more human and personal instead of talking about technicalities and contracts until you're blue in the face. Absolutely. They'll they'll remember the stories or remember how you make them feel. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you in a second about some of the, the hardest sells of your career or some of the most notable or crazy. So I'll give you a second to chew on that. But until then, um, for the average realtor, maybe they're just getting into business. Maybe they're having the first year of their career 10 years in a row, which we always talked about. How can they get better at sales? How can they really uh, invest in their training or how can they become better salespeople? You know, I think you're, 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 the biggest investment you have is in yourself. So make sure that what you're doing is are you listening to the radio and you're listening to the current pop song or rap song or are you listening to maybe a podcast? When you get home, are you watching you know, reality TV or are you getting on YouTube and watching whoever's got the newest sales technique or you know, some classic sales techniques? Um, I think just investing that time in yourself is going to help you and it's going to help you be more comfortable and confident, um, that more so than anything. And then the other thing is understanding is whoever can be comfortable in the mundane and the consistently doing it. So it's just like a, a, a water dripping on, um, a rock created the grand Canyon, right? Mm-hmm. Over thousands and thousands of years. So you just have to be that little drop of water day after day, after day, after day. So you can create something big. Mm, the the consistency and the right habits, right? I mean, so many realtors say, okay, it's January 1st. I'm going to have an epic year. Let me, you know, do this and that and go to a conference and hire people to help me and invest in this. And then they don't, you know, all of it's gone by February 1st. So that, that consistency and that, uh, you know, change in your daily habits. Yeah. Right. Everyone's looking for the silver bullet and it doesn't exist. Yeah. The silver bullet, it shows up as hard work. Mm, yeah, absolutely. You got that right. Um, so now, what are some of the? Uh, do you have any funny stories or crazy sales? Or I mean, I know you have a million of them because I was there with you for a hundred thousand of them back in the day. But uh, any funny uh, transactions or anything like that that come to mind? You know, that's a, a good question. You know, there's there's so many. I remember the. Here you go. The very first house I ever sold. The very first listing that I ever had. Um, I went to a listing appointment. I was working with Prudential, and it, you had to have a um, mentor with you, right, on your first deal, which makes sense. You know, we don't know what we're doing. Um, and I remember going to this house. I was all proud. It was on the neighborhood, which I won't, I won't name the name of the street, but it was a it was a very nice neighborhood in the hood, right? Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And I went to this house, and I'm sitting there doing the listing appointment, and the lady's just kind of all over the place, and it's a kind of a semi hoarder house. And I looked down, and they had cheesy little dogs. And once I had sat down, I realized that I had just crossed a minefield. There was dog poop <laughs> everywhere in that house. It was unbelievable. And you know what? We got the listing. We sold the house. But I'll never forget just sitting down. It's like, what am I looking at? And now there's been so many times I've walked in literally hoarders homes. Yeah. Um, you know, th- those are sort of things that just it, – it's. Interesting, and you know, you don't want every listing that you have. Sometimes you, I'm not going to fight real hard for that. But there's things like that. There's the the little old lady that you just fall in love with that you, you know, you want to adopt, and you know, you'll do anything. It's not about the money. It's about you know helping them get to their next phase of life. Yeah. Um. And and I think those are some of the more gratifying ones um, that really come to mind. I think part of it is just uh, you know, 
I think a good real, real estate agent, and I'll give you a tip on this, is I go back to the term investor, and we talk about how sexy it sounds. Most investors are not investors at all. They're neophyte investors. Mm-hmm. Very few sophisticated, successful investors are out there. Mm. And so often than not, realtors and real estate agents will be very intimidated when someone identifies himself as an investor. More often than not, just look at whatever seminar just came to town, and that's probably where they came from. Yeah. And they're trying to find a, buy a house for no money down or little money down, and they want to put and or a sign, so they'll write a contract to put and or signs, and basically they're trying to be a middle person to go ahead and you know just get in the way of a deal and try to make a buck. Mm-hmm. And so I think the, the more that you're aware of what an investor really looks like and what they're really looking at, and so questions you can ask somebody is, you know, hey, Norm, what rate of return are you looking for? You know, what sort of return are you looking for on your money? What sort of investments do you currently have? Do you prefer commercial? Do you prefer residential? Do you want multifamily? You know, and then you ask the questions. Remember, in any situation, in a sales situation, he or she who asks the questions controls the conversation. Mm. And I was sharing this with one of my agents earlier today is sometimes, you know, we've all done it. We pick up the phone and that person is machine gunning you. How much is a house? How many rooms? Da, 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 da. And they're just like, like you're, you're a bit uncomfortable by it, right? Yeah. And so you have to be able to not get punked and flip it around and start asking the questions. Whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second. So what exactly are you looking for? Yeah. How long have you been looking for? How many offers have you written? Well, I assume that you're calling me that you're not working with an agent. Hey, Norm, when you find the right house, will you need to get out of a lease or sell another property? Okay, great. And when we get that house, do you intend to pay cash or are you going to finance? Are you going to finance? Fantastic. Um, do you have a lender or would you like me to refer a good one for you? You know, these are the sort of things that you take over and a person's going to actually appreciate you for it because, you know, it's not really a democracy as much as people think. If you were buying a house or if you needed a good attorney, do you want someone's going to sit down and say, hey, Norm, what, what should we do? Or it's like, sit down, shut up. I'm going to keep your ass out of jail. This is exactly yeah. what we need to do. Well, with real right? estate, that, too. That's what like I want to hire. Yeah, and with real <laughs> estate and sales, you know, there's a lot of agents who are saying, I sell homes, I'll sell your home but then they're not even investing in being a salesperson or sales themselves, which is pretty ironic, right? Exactly. And, and it, there's so much language involved. It could be something as simple as, you know, hey, Norm, I'm not trying to sell you a home. I'm trying to find the right I'm, – I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hey, Norm, I'm not trying to sell you a house. I'm trying to find the right home for you and your family. Yeah. House is cold. Home is warm. Mm. You know, and, and when, you, when you really start analyzing that – You'll see things like, for example, I'm a fairly large guy. If you come up to me, it could be intimidating. So I'll typically stand at like a 45-degree angle, and it makes me look smaller. It also gives an air of indifference that you're not really that important, Mm -hmm. which is kind of cool when you're at an open house. And then only once that person engages – would you go ahead and actually face them and give them your undivided attention? Mm. Um, there's just so many things you can do. Or with your voice, you can just lower your voice. If you want to draw somebody in, maybe you have a husband and a wife, and they're sitting at the table, and the husband's acting like he's too bothered to be there, and he's trying to watch the TV in the other room. If you want to get his attention, just go ahead and start whispering or lower your voice to his wife. That guy's going to immediately come oh right my back God, and that's great. you're going to get his yeah. attention. Yeah, and there's so many little tactics I remember for different personality types too. Like you get the the husband who's always the do DIY. I know everything better than everyone, you know, and and you got to hit him with the analytical and you know push and pull at the same time. And it, there's so many little subtle techniques for different personality types. Absolutely, or the person that brings along their their subject matter expert. Oh, this is my friend Bill. Bill's bought ten homes. Right. And that's called the third baseman. And so what do you do? You play to the third baseman. I don't have to sell you. I have to sell Bill. Yeah. And I was like, well, Bill, you know, Norm's so fortunate that he brought you around. That you, you bought 10 homes? That's great. So clearly you understand what a good value this home is. Not just boom, 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 boom. Yeah. That's the easy sell. You just have to make sure you know who you're selling to. Yeah. So with the, uh, with the new uh, office and with the agents under your care – and I know you help anyone. You you just love this stuff. You don't care if they come off the street or if they work for you or not. But what uh what kind of sales training or education do you guys do on a regular basis? Um, so we have a weekly sit down with the broker. That'd be me. Uh, sit down and just bring your sack lunch and talk whatever you want. Also, I have opened up my office so the agents can come on in and uh, they can drop in. I have a desk that you know right. Uh, rise and fall in terms of the adjustable desk so we can stand up and lead generate 
And I just want people to come in and get fed the way they need to be fed. Mm. I do ask they go ahead and use the resources that are available. There's so much online that you use the online training to do that. But once you've done that, if you still have questions, then come back and ask me those questions. But So I, we're, it's better suited for me to be able to successfully run my business and serve my clients if each person has a, a personal accountability towards their education. But clearly you don't know everything. So then those questions that weren't answered from an easy video or something, then come on in and ask me about those. Yeah. Yeah, the next level of questions. That's great. So you right. guys are doing a lot and then, on a regular basis. Yep. And then the other thing is just like, you know, I think the worst thing that people do in real estate is they don't understand leverage. So finding out when you need to leverage somebody out. So when you first come in the business, you know, do a transaction or two and, and you know, use a tra don't use a transaction coordinator on the first one or two just so you can see how much of a is, is horrible. Mm. And then after that, for the rest of your life, use a transaction mm. coordinator. They're worth the money. Yeah. And then when you get to a certain production level, then it's time for you to hire an assistant. And people, that's like, they're scared to hire the assistant. But if you hire the right assistant, you should be able to double your business, literally. My assistant, she checks all my emails. She checks my phone. She negotiates deals. She does. She runs the office. Yeah. And, and, and it allows me to do higher activities. And then later on, you, you do a little bit more business and you're able to hire maybe your first buyer's agent mm. and you go ahead and hire a buyer's agent. That was like the hardest thing in the world is to hire a buyer's agent and, you know, trust somebody with one of my clients. But once I did it, it was the best thing I ever did and it freed up my time. And so you, yes, you're going to give up some money because you're paying somebody, but you shouldn't hire somebody that you're not going to make money off of. Right. Yeah. So if at the end of the day I have a buyer's agent and they make a hundred thousand dollars and I make a hundred thousand dollars because of their effort, that's a win-win. You know, some people say, well, you know, that guy's giving away half of his money. And my mentality is, no, I'm giving away half of my money. Yeah. And the, the, the business reality is when the person had never made more than thirty or forty thousand dollars in their life, and now they're making a hundred thousand dollars, it's not the split, it's how much money you're actually making. And I hear I hear so many agents that are worried about a split, and the split is like the last thing I'm ever worried about. Yeah, and everyone's uh, focused on, you know, how big are their piece of the pie, but they don't realize, you know, when you do it right, the pie is twice as big, right? So everyone everyone eats, to use that analogy. But, uh, so, right, well, oh, go ahead. They, they, they say, would you rather have 100% of a grape or 50% of a watermelon? There you go, man. There you go. So what, uh, you, you've seen a lot now over real estate, man. You're a, a grizzled veteran at this point. Um Two questions. What are some of the best, who are some of the best salespeople you've seen in general in any field, like lenders or anything? And then also, who is someone that you re recognize that has come in and was just terrible at sales and didn't know what they were doing and fumbling all over, but they took advantage of these training and they improved themselves and became good? So the, the, the great salesperson, also the person that went from zero to hero. Well, I, I won't necessarily name names, um, but uh, there, there's some people that what I find, I guess, um, the traits and behaviors, the, the most successful people that I've ever worked with are the ones that come in, and I call it going Mr. Miyagi on him, Mr. Miyagi and Danny from the Karate Kid, mm -hmm. that person that comes in and is just obedient to your word. And I know that sounds weird in this day and age, but that person just does exactly what you say. If someone is going to um, allow you, uh, it's going to mentor you, like, for example, I have a mentor right now, and the guy's name is Brent Gove. And if Brent says, does do something, I do it. And I, I, I produce a nice level. I have a lot of experience. But Brent says, hey, Kevin, you do this? I just go do it. He says, hey, you want me to come to your office and put on a workshop? No problem. Just make sure the office is full. And what I do, I go out there and I make sure the office is full. Mm. So when you find somebody that, you know, maybe they have something that you don't have but you want it, and they're willing to show you how to get it, then you don't question it. You just do what they say. And like, we remember the Karate Kid when you thought Mr. Miyagi was being mean to Danny and he was waxing the car, painting the fence, sanding the, the, the deck. All of it didn't make sense until he got attacked and he was able to defend himself. Mm -hmm. And that's how this game is. If you have the right mentor, you need to trust them to do what they say. Otherwise, you should not have that mentor. You picked the wrong one or you're not ready for one. Yeah. And when they do it, you will both benefit. Mm, absolutely. Well, that's some, some great wisdom. We definitely got some really good advice on sales from Kevin Cooper, the mega agent. Are you a mega agent, Kevin? You know what? I'm just a guy trying to get ahead. <laughs> You're doing all right, man. You're doing all right. Hey, so uh, give a shout out again to your new office and your staff and anyone else you want. If someone's uh, looking to buy or sell a home in the Sacramento area, where should they go? 
They should go to Cooper and Associates Realty. Um, we're right here on Laguna Boulevard and Highway 5. And uh, what we do is we have our motto, Cooper and Associates, the best movie you'll ever make. And I'm so blessed. Um, I work with my lovely wife, Samantha. I work with my daughter, who's my assistant, Jasmine. Um, and then we have our team with Kelly, Simeon, and uh, also we have Greg now who's joined our team. So we're very, very fortunate. Um, we can service a greater Sacramento area. But most importantly, we want to make sure that each one of our clients know that they're valued and they're um, they're listened to. So if you want somebody who's going to represent you, you know, not an average realtor, but somebody who's above average, that's who you want to call. That's us.